Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. With high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Let's sing the chorus one more time. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Now the chorus. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Bethel. It is good to see you here uh, worshiping with us. We've got a couple announcements. Um, this week is our fellowship meal. If you have not signed up, please do that online. Uh, and if you don't have access online, please take care of that um, first thing Monday morning so that uh, Anna knows um, how many to, to cook for. Also, Wednesday, we are doing um, our um, 
community service at Stone Church, uh, and uh, there is still opportunity to sign up for that, uh, and if you want to participate in that event as well. And lastly, you will notice the gentleman up at fr in the front. We're going to put offering back in, in the service. Um, that's going to happen uh, each service immediately following our announcements during the first song. So you're going to have to multitask. You're going to be standing. <laughs> you're going to be singing. And there's, they're going to be passing the plate. So uh, that, that will be happening uh, on most weeks. Uh, may not happen every week. The boxes will still be out there uh, as well. Please stand as we continue to sing with We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices sacrifices of joy. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits.
Psalm 19 says this to us, the law of the Lord is perfect or blameless, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I like that one. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then he goes on to say all of that, to say more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, or because by them, is your servant warned in keeping them is great reward as we look at the scripture toward the end of our study of the book of galatians we'll see some of that played out again even more today as we think about what it begins to mean for us to walk in the spirit and how paul works that out and and defines that thinking about the law from behind and the spirit in our lives going forward. So as we pray together as a family this morning, I would invite you to come to the altar if you would like or to pray with someone this morning if you would like uh, or you can be seated uh, whatever is the most comfortable for you in this time of family prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we just thank you for the privilege to be in your house today to worship you. We thank you that we can live in a country where we have that freedom to do that. Lord, we thank you for the men and women who have sacrificed to provide that freedom for us. And we ask a special blessing upon them and their families. 
those that have served and those that are serving as we speak. Lord, so we just lift them up to you. Lord, I thank you for each one that's here today. I thank you that they were able to come. Lord, may we just honor and glorify you today with our with our songs of worship to you and our prayer time that right now as we lift up our hearts to you and as we gave our offerings today. Lord, as we listen to your word, as Pastor Wendell opens your word and speaks to us the words that you would have us to hear today, we ask that your Holy Spirit would have freedom to work in our lives, that we would open our hearts and our minds and be receptive to your word. Lord, we do, it's, it's just such a privilege to be here, and I, I, I thank you for those that could be here. And those that couldn't, Lord, we just lift them up for whatever reason. Lord, we just ask that you'll touch them today. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your strength, for your friendship, for being there at times when Lord, we feel alone. We know that you're there with us, Lord. We thank you for your wisdom and your power. We thank you for all that you do in our lives. Many times we don't even realize how you're working in our lives, but you are and you're there. And we thank you for that. So again today, Lord, we give this day, day and this time to you as we worship and praise you. In Jesus' name. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life. Good morning, and welcome again as we continue to walk through the letter of Paul to the churches in Galatia, and as we, as we begin to get to this place in this letter, uh, there's a little bit of hard stuff that we have to work through. Um, I need to work through, then you get the benefit of me working through because, of course, what you, what you receive is what God is working on me and my life about. And so uh, as, we, 
as we think through this this morning, I would just kind of invite you again to, to just lean in a little bit uh, and hear what God is saying to us as we read uh, this portion of Scripture in Galatians ch chapter 5. The reason I invite you to lean in is because we don't much like to talk about the darkness. You know, I'm not, now I'm not talking about the darkness that happens when you walk into a room that has no lights on. I'm talking about the darkness that kind of lurks within each one of us. Darkness as it relates to things that we want to keep hidden or the things that we want to kind of keep suppressed. It's the darkness that, that Paul speaks of when he's talking about getting out of step with God. This particular scripture that we're going to read today, remember Paul is writing to believers. So as we read this scripture with that thought, thinking about the darkness simply because we have gotten out of step with the Spirit. You remember a couple of weeks ago with the demonstration of walking by the Spirit and what that looked like. And it was much, much easier for the one who was blindfolded to walk and not stumble as long as they stayed directly in line with and in step with the Spirit. But as soon as they were either out of step or out of line with the Spirit or not walking in the Spirit at all, we saw the disastrous results of that. All right, and Marge hasn't been here since because of the disastrous results of that. All right, not a true statement, okay? But the darkness that I'm talking about, the darkness is the darkness of Samson. The one who was a Nazarite from birth. The one whose mother and father before his birth were given instructions on things to do and to not do in order for Samson to be able to be a Nazarite and walk in step with the Spirit. But Samson had a darkness. This is the darkness of him going down to Timnah, we read in Judges chapter 14. And he saw a woman of the Philistines. And she was pleasing in his own eyes. And so the Samson who... This is the darkness of Samson who also loved a woman of the Philistines whose name was Delilah. Who we also know that through the course of time that he revealed, if you will, the secret of his strength. Which he mistakenly thought was in his hair. Okay. And fortunately for many of us, the secret of our strength is not in our hair. Samson, if you know the story and if you read and look through that story, Samson spent many days, much of his public life, out of step, if you will, with the Spirit. This darkness that I'm talking about is the darkness of David. David, the man after God's own heart, who in the middle of the night, on a rooftop, saw a woman bathing. 
And the Bible tells us that this woman was beautiful to behold. Okay? And I want you to center on that word, behold. It says that the woman bathing on the rooftop was beautiful to behold. And behold means to let your gaze linger. And so he did. And many events out of that darkness. See, David was supposed to be out to battle because it was the spring when kings go out to battle. And yet, he chose to be out of step with the Spirit. This darkness that I'm talking about is Saul. The darkness of Saul, the man that God chose to be the first king of the nation of Israel. Who, because of continued disobedience and continued unfaithfulness to God, God chose then to to do what he says he will do if we live in unrepentant sin and he will stop hearing our prayers. And he stopped answering Saul's prayers and Saul was scared and afraid because of the prospect of facing the Philistine army. And so he called for a medium, a sorcerer, one who would proclaim claim to be able to Bring up the dead to speak. Saul, who had already been shown to be out of step with the Spirit. Yet this proved to be the last straw, if you will. But see, this darkness that I'm speaking of, it's not just Samson's darkness, it's not just David's darkness, it's not just Saul's darkness. Because we would consider all of those three sets of darkness some of the big stuff, right? The big sins that we never fall victim to, right? No, this darkness that I'm talking about, this darkness is the darkness of your pastor, who, when he shows up at the start of a group bike ride on his 20-plus-year-old heavy steel, you're going to get a workout on that bike, bike. And he sees all of the bikes that people have upgraded to carbon fiber. And he gets a little jealous. At least until he remembers how much they cost. But it's a real thing, my friends. It's a real thing. Okay? Because it's going to be a workout on the bike that I speak of. And so we must, if, if I'm out of step with the Spirit, it can be troubling, the things that go on in my head. This, this darkness that I speak of, it is not an always thing. We'll see that as we go through this scripture. But it can be overwhelming, and it can be potentially destructive. To you and to others. And so as Paul writes to these new converts in the region of Galatia, what he writes is both words of warning and words of encouragement and instruction. Because even as we can get out of step, we also know and understand, and I want you to hear that there is redemption as well. Remember, he is talking uh, to and about believers. So it is, it is important for us to know that there is a way to stay in step with the Spirit. And he gives us that 
as well. So you stand this morning, Galatians chapter 5, as we begin to read, starting in verse number 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16. Paul says this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing thing, the things that you want to do. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ah. Here we go, finally. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things or against these things, there is no law. Would I read that again? 22? Yes, are you, okay, you tell me when to keep moving forward, all right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Can be patient, okay? We just talked about this. Kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and everyone's favorite, self-control. Encouragement next. Against these things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. And that you would open our eyes and you would open our ears and you would open our hearts to what you would have us to hear and to see and to gain from your message to us this morning. Remove me from the equation, Father. And be very present in our lives as we go through these verses. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Two lists. Two completely different lists. One describing the possible actions of a believer walking in the flesh or walking out of step with the Spirit. Okay? And one list describing the characteristics of that very same believer. Okay, hear me. That very same believer, if he or she is walking in step with the Spirit. It's the same person that he's talking to. The flesh, if you will. All right, we defined that. Let me define it again. The works of the flesh, or the flesh, is the actions or the attitudes that result from giving in to the moral and spiritual weakness 
and helplessness of human nature or our old sin nature that is still clinging to what kind of souls? Redeemed souls, all right? We are subject, believers are subject to sin. We must understand that. We must not embrace that, but we must recognize that it is, we, we do these things, right? And the process that we go through then should be one of grief unto repentance, just as if we were not redeemed. That is what we call this progressive sanctification, which is the living in a state and a mindset of repentance. Because we have, even in our redeemed state, a bent or a nature of sin. So that's what these two lists are for. They're, they're to the same person. And so as I deal with my jealousy, as I deal with my envy, it's the same as Samson's dealing with his everything, whatever, I'm going to do whatever is right in my own eyes. It's the same. But it's also easy, as we read verses and lists like this, it's easy to read these lists without giving a whole lot of thought to the first list or the what is on the darkness list. But if we weren't to consider them, then God, through the Holy Spirit, would have just inspired to Paul to write, instead of a list of 17 different actions or attitudes, plus whatever is involved in and things like these, he would have just said a bunch of bad things. That would have been the end of that scripture, right? If you're out of step with the Spirit, it's possible you're going to do a bunch of bad things. And then he would have gotten to all the good things, which is the fruits of the Spirit, which we love to hear. Right? Because we absolutely all the time, in every way and area of our life, display them. Right? And so we must consider them. So I want us to consider them this morning. I want us to look at them briefly, each one of them, the list of the bad things, but then we'll also get some encouragement through the list of the good things. Okay, so let's dive into that, and I'll try to go faster than normal, all right? What are the works of the flesh? Paul outlines them in four different categories, all right? Sex, religion, relationships, and indulgences. And as we go through them, what I want you to do, you'll notice in your bulletin, is, a, is just a blank space. Okay? I don't want you to write down every one as we go through them. Okay? What I want you to focus on, as I had to focus on, what I want you to focus on is those that you struggle with. And then I want you to write them down, okay? And then, but here's the thing, all right? If we get to the end of the list and you've written nothing down, then I want you to write pride in the middle of that section, okay? So you're not going to get off the hook completely here in this particular section, okay? Because you're just not. Here we go. All right, four categories, sex, religion, relationships, and indulgences. The first category is, is sex, and he outlines three different areas, sexual immorality, impurity, and, sexu and, and sensuality. All right, they all kind of revolve around the same thing, but here's kind of the definition of it, all right? Sexual immorality is that sexual sin that we've, in our culture, we've deemed to be culturally acceptable. It is not just condoned, but it's, it's almost as if it's regarded as normal and or essential. All right? Sexual immorality. Biblical, biblical sexual immorality can be defined as this. Any any, any 
All right, did you get that? Sexual activity or sexual encounter outside of the confines of marriage between one man and one woman. That is the definition, the biblical definition of sexual immorality. Anything that happens outside of the confines of marriage between one man and one woman. And according to Matthew chapter 5, it includes what goes on up here as well. Okay, that is that definition. And, and, and so Paul says if we're out of step with the spirit, we, fall, we can fall victim to sexual immorality or impurity or what other translations might call uncleanness. Okay, there's a whole section in, in Leviticus about, um, about um, becoming pure again after a woman's menstrual cycle and, and what that looks like and how long it takes for you to be, be able to, to be able to, here's the words, present yourself before God again. So this impurity is that which we may do that makes a man or a woman unfit to come before God, okay, probably due to some kind of sexual immorality, all right? The word literally means, all right, the, the, the word literally means a pus-filled infection, So if you consider the, and, and the number of things that had to happen, if, if it was leprosy, for example, the, the, the things that you had to do, you had to call yourself out to be what? Unclean, right? So if, if in this impurity piece of it, you're supposed to call yourself out as unclean because it's the same picture is of some kind of infection that's very visible, right? But of course, since it's the darkness, we kind of want to keep it. That's impurity. This, this, it's covering our lives with, thi with things that separate us from God. The third area that he talks about here is sensuality. Sensuality. That is, you are, you allow yourself to be ready for any pleasure. Ready for any pleasure. You remember the last verse of the book of Judges? It might be one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. The last book. All right, sensuality says you allow yourself to do what? Be ready for any pleasure. There is no restraint. And you don't even care what anybody thinks anymore. Right? About your actions or your attitudes. You're just going to do it. Right? The last verse of the book of Judges, chapter 21 and verse 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You see, that's where sensuality comes in. If it feels right, if it looks right, if it sounds right, it's got to be right. It's going to be right for me. Because, man, it, it, just, it just fits. So, three of those works of the flesh. Now, whatever that means for you in this context or in this crowd, it may not be one of those, none of those may be at an issue for you. But remember, remember, it's not just the physical. It's the brain activity, the thought activity as well, right? The next area that he talks about is this, this area of religion, and he really names two areas that we need to pay attention to. One of them is idolatry, and one of them is sorcery or witchcraft, and we want to talk a little bit about that. Idolatry is that one thing that we never have any issue with. We'd never, you know, it's, that, it's, it's any of those things that take the place of God. It could be as good a thing as your children. It can be as good a thing as your grandchildren, right? Sometimes your grandchildren may even be a better thing than your children. 
right? Because you get to send them home after you do all the things that you would never have done with your own children. It's like idolatry. We, 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 we need to guard ourselves against anything that we would say would take the place of God. But then I want to talk about this other one, sorcery, <clears throat> for just a second. It is literally, the, the word literally means the use of drugs. And <clears throat> it, it was used by those, we, I said Paul or Saul had uh, at one point, he called for a medium. And what's interesting is Saul, not too long before he called for a medium, he had made them illegal and he had run them all out of the nation of Israel. He had said literally, get out, we can have no part of you. Oh, by the way, well, I think God's not listening to me now, so would you go find me a medium? And so they did, right? Right? But what this means and what this looks like is it literally it was the way that they conjured things up was, was through this, the use of, of drugs and, and ways that would take you out of your ability to be in control, all right? What does that look like for us today? I think sometimes we, we think that some of these Things that Paul would label as sorcery, okay, um, are, are really very innocent. But I can assure you that the devil doesn't. Because this is the devil's playground, okay? We can say out loud that, you know, I don't really believe that stuff. But then... We attribute certain actions or certain reactions to our sign. Right. What am I? January, what is that? Thank you for not knowing. Okay, perfect. Right? At least off the top of your head. Somebody's Googling it right now. Okay, I don't want to know. Okay? Listen, listen. We say, I don't believe this stuff, but then we, we say, but, you know, it, I'm, I'm just an Aquarius, so, you know. And, and I can't marry a Capricorn, or I'm the most compatible with a Pisces or something, whatever it is, right? Here's the thing. We 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 don't believe it, but we live our lives by it. We know more about that, we read more about that than we do about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. What are the fruits of the Spirit? I'm I'm January. What is my sign? You don't know, but what are the fruits of the Spirit? Did you get them all? I don't know, right? I think I might have got a few of them, right? So we know more about our astrological sign than we do about how the Holy Spirit works in our life. So which one is in control? What are we paying attention to really? Again, I said, I want you to pay attention to the things that you struggle with, not, okay, that's, that's it. Here's my question as it relates to sorcery, witchcraft, horoscopes, astrological signs, all of that stuff. Here's my question, right? Why would a believer intentionally engage the devil? Let's go on. Come on, Pastor. Let's move forward, all right? <clears throat> Category number three, relationships, all right? This is probably the area that we're going to, that, that, that you're going to write something down, all right? It may be the area that you're most likely to write something down, all right? What are we talking about here? Enmities. That is hostility toward others. Hostility, acts of a hostility toward others. This is the opposite of the, 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 
the second greatest commandment according to Jesus, which is love your neighbor as yourself. Enmity. Strife. Strife is rivalries. Like red and yellow versus blue and orange. Right? Not necessarily. It's rivalries that lead to quarrels or fights. All right? This is, that's what strife is. If you create strife, you're creating hostility and rivalries. All right? Jealousy. We talked a little bit about that. Covetousness that leads to anger or different kinds of actions. Right? I want to ride your bike. I want you to ride my bike. Unless I bring that back under control, all right? The next one, all right? Fits of anger. Fits of anger. These are outbursts, or you just blow up. But what you blow up is whatever is in your path. Fits of anger, right? Oh, but we justify these, right? Here's my justification. I'm a, I'm a what? what? What am I? I don't even know, right? One of our justifications is that's just who I am, right? That's how God made me, right? Is that not the case? That's what I said a thousand times. Well, that's just how God made me. Forgetting that I'm talking about a believer here who God did what? He remade into a new creation. Right? But we fall back into our old. That's what he's talking about here. This is that, I just have a bad temper. I just have a short fuse. I mean, it's just my heritage. I'm just competitive. Which, again, is just nothing other than an excuse for bad behavior. This piece of this, this is that, we might, this is that piece that we might even apologize very quickly because it is just an outburst. It is just a fit of anger, right? So we may find ourselves apologizing very quickly, but the struggle and the trouble is that some of these destructions that happen, they're not easily fixed. I struggle. Right? This is your pastor. Right? Fits of anger. Dissensions is the next one. Rivalries and factions and dissensions. This is the breaking apart of relationships by causing one or the other party to choose a side. It is the opposite of the military's band of brothers. This is, this is what we call politics. It is rivalries or factions or dissensions. One commentator put it this way, and I want you to hear this, and I want you to hear this very, very, very clearly. We should, it should be possible to differ with a man, and yet remain friends. You see, I read an article that in the midst of this article, the person said, you know, his mother would ask him, he said, why do you, why, why do you have a gun? And the response was, nobody fights with their fists anymore. I own guns, all right, so I'm not talking about that piece of it, all right? I'm talking about, talking about let's, let's figure it out. It should be possible to disagree and still be friends. Don't write any of those down on your sheet. Envy is the next one, all right? What is envy? Envy is next-level jealousy. 
This is jealousy on steroids. This is, you have it, right? I don't want it, but by gosh, I don't want you to have it either. That's envy. You can't even have it. I don't even like the fact that you have it, but I don't want it, right? But it hurts me inside. It makes me angry that you have it, right? That's envy, right? So we have relationship category here that would probably cover a multitude of us, all right? The fourth uh, are indulgences. These are, there's two things that, that he talks about. Drunkenness, which is this, the out of control. Uh, this is what is the, out of, the, the result of out of control alcohol use. We know that, all right? This is the sin that the Bible speaks of as it relates to alcohol, drunkenness. Because we don't figure out we want to figure out what it means to live in self-control. And the next one is carousing or orgies, right? <clears throat> I love the words that the Bible gives us, right? This is just goes back to one of the sexual areas as well. It's unrestrained and uncontrolled celebrating. This is a riot after a victory, right? This is a chief's victory parade. It's just unrestrained, and it's just whatever, right? In their context, in Paul's context, this had a lot to do with the sexual piece of it that had to do with the pagan worship ceremonies. The orgies and the sexual activity that took place in those. Right? And then finally, Paul says, and things like these, as if the other 17 weren't enough. Right? It's, as, as Paul said in Romans, they not only practice these things, but they, you know, it's, it's we're the ones who invent, right, the things that go on in our mind that, in, that, that are the inventions of evil. Right? Watch these television shows. It's like, who thinks of that? Right? That's what Paul is talking about. And things like these. Right? Maybe you've got to write down and things like these. I, I, I don't know. Right? But what, what essentially what he's saying is that this list that he lays out about the works of the flesh, it's not an exhaustive list. But it also is not a everything all the time list. You see, these are things that we fall victim to should we get out of step with the Spirit, potentially. You may not, even if you're out of step with the Spirit, okay? It's not a, you're going to do one of these, but you can do one of these. It's possible, all right? Because, as I said, and as I want us to hear, believers do fall into sin. We just do, all right? As a result of temptation. But we also fall into sin because we fall out of step with the Spirit. Okay, the devil is at work in the temptation area, right? That's why I question, why would you intentionally engage the devil when he's already at work in the first place? Right? But we also get out of step with the Spirit. And so he gives a warning there in verse, in verse 21. This says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And what he means by that is not that if you just do them, but if you practice them, if this is your lifestyle, okay? Because the truth of this is what the, what, if you dive in and you dig into what that actually means, I warn you that those who do those things, such who, those who practice those things, those who, this is my lifestyle, the reason you will not inherit the kingdom of God is that because that, that, that is a sign of an unregenerate soul. You've not truly given your heart to Christ if this is your lifestyle, 
if these are the things that control you. It's a sign of an unregenerate heart. And it's not of a believer falling into sin and subsequently then being grieved unto repentance. Okay? That is the difference. And so Paul works through that list, all right? But then he gives us some encouragement. He gives us the other side. And this is, this is the list that says this is how you can live these are the things that are displayed if you stay in step with the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I missed one, and I'll get to it. All right, Love. The first one of these is that word that, that for the Greeks and for the, for the people that Paul was writing to, they didn't even have a word for this kind of love. This was a made-up word by Jesus. It's that word agape, love. Jesus made the word up. He made the concept up. It didn't exist before Jesus. And so it is that which is, is seeking the highest good of another. That's the kind of love that a believer in step with the Spirit will display. It is a deliberate effort. It doesn't just happen. It is a conscious effort. It means I have to act out of the will, not just the emotions. You see, the emotion, the emotional love is all of the love that the world knows. It's this kind of love that the world needs. And it's this kind of love that we are commanded to demonstrate. And it only happens out of a relationship with Jesus by walking in the Spirit. The highest good of another. Love is the first one of those fruits. Everything else flows out of that, of course, but joy, all right? It is a settled confidence that everything, all the time, is right between me and God. Joy. A settled confidence. You're in the midst of the biggest battle you've ever faced. But you have a settled confidence in your relationship with God. Peace is the calmness of mind because, because God is in control. I can have peace because I know God is in control, even in the midst of all of that. Again, you're working through that, driving through that storm, walking through that storm, or whatever is being placed in your path and in your life. And you can have peace, knowing that God is in control. Patience. We saw that undemonstrated this morning, right? As we were working through them, right? Patience with, with others and our circumstances. This is long-suffering. Long-suffering sometimes. Long-suffering sometimes. This is tolerance toward others. This is not tolerance toward sin. All right, we'll talk more about that next week. This is not tolerance toward sin. This is tolerance toward people and circumstances. All right, most of the references to 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 patience in the New Testament, they, they reflect God's attitude toward man. Right? His long suffering toward your pastor and his jealousy and fits of anger. How he helps me walk through that piece of my life. So to be Christ-like, to display this means that I am to act toward others as Christ acts toward me. Let that sink in for just a second. Right? We struggle with forgiveness because we don't think we should. Right? We forget that forgiveness is a command and God is patient toward me in my sin. 
So that's just one. Kindness, tender concern for another. Tender concern for another, right? But it's one thing to have tender concern for another. I can have all kinds of kindness and still show no goodness. Because goodness is active kindness. What am I going to do now? How is it manifested? Faithfulness, that means to be trustworthy. To say what you're going to do and do what you said you were going to do. To be loyal. Gentleness. To be considerate of others. To be, show a, 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 a meekness towards them. That you're, even though you could overpower them, that you don't. That word literally is that sign as we saw, or we, we, we saw in the Beatitudes of the bridling of a horse to bring the power of that horse under control. And then lastly, self-control. That is actually showing restraint of the passions and the appetites that we have. Right? That I can be in control of myself so that I can serve others. You see, you can't serve others if you're not in control of yourself. So those are the fruits of the Spirit. And in contrast to the works of the flesh, see, Paul's intent here is to remind us that this is an all things, all the time list. You're not just supposed to be a kindness Christian. It's an all things, all the time list. Now, some of them may be in less evident fashion than others at certain times. But the only way that this can happen is by staying in step with the Spirit because these are the fruits of the Spirit. They are not produced by yourself. And so what happens is that every believer is a hybrid tree. We are all of these things. All of these fruits are supposed to fall off of our tree. They're supposed to be evident on our tree. Some of them, again, they may be in different stages of maturity in di on different days. But they're all to be evident. You're never to be out of season. Goodness is never supposed to go out of season. Faithfulness is never supposed to go out of season. Self-control is never, Wendell, supposed to go out of season. And so what Paul says to us is this. Against such things, there is no law. What does he mean by that? Here is your encouragement, believer. Demonstrate these fruits of the Spirit. Stay in step with these, the, the Spirit and display these, all right? He's telling this same thing to these same converts that he's warned about walking, getting out of step with the Spirit. But what he's saying is that you don't even, so all of these Pharisees are telling you that we're talking about grace plus the law and grace plus circumcision and grace plus obedience and grace plus all of this. And Paul says, no, it's just grace. And if you'll display the fruits of these spirits, you won't even need the law. Because these are a law unto themselves being played out and lived out and displayed in your life. They come from the Spirit dwelling within. And again, the Spirit, if we're in step with the Spirit, the Spirit is not going to take you where God does not want you to go. So he says in verse 25, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, your word can be hard and your word can be so very encouraging to us. And I thank you for both of them. I thank you that I need to be warned of the things that I need to watch out for. And God, I thank you for the encouragement that you give me to know that.
that if I stay in step with you, that there, there is nothing that can overtake me. So God, thank you for your word and its truth. Help us to, to, to absorb this and to, to, to embrace this. But God, also help us to live this and demonstrate this to a world that so badly needs an example of your spirit in their lives. Thank you for what you're going to do in our lives this week. Help us to be strong in the Lord and be of good courage as we go about our daily lives. So as you've heard these two lists this morning, I don't know what you struggle with. I don't know what you struggle with in the darkness. I don't know which area you need to, to fertilize on the good side. But I know that there are areas in my life that are. So if, and, and, and so that, that there just are. So I would encourage you to just pay attention to what Paul says to us. So let's stand this morning and let's sing our way out of here today. If there's anything that you need to speak with me about, I'd be down here in front. I'd be welcome the opportunity to speak with you and to pray with you before we leave today. Let's sing and be dismissed. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide and it's great so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Have a great week.